Okay, this does not surprise me at all that we have a very small uh, group tonight, uh, but that's okay. Um, hopefully we'll be quick, you guys have got better things to do, and unusually for me, I don't know what I'm having for dinner yet. I'm, but as you've probably worked out, I'm a very food motivated person and that's usually what's on my mind as I do these shoots. Uh, so here we go. Um, I am going to start with some questions because I know we've got at least one participant itching to ask them. And then the plan for the rest of the shoot is to work through what I've called the in-class problem, but it's kind of an out-of-class problem because we're going to do it in this shoot instead of in the face-to-face -face room. Uh, if any of you um, are worried, thinking I'm gonna miss out on that, if I'm, but it, I'd be rather working on the assignment, uh, do not worry because the problem is almost exactly the same as the quiz that is in the materials, uh, the timber top quiz. So if you've done that or you plan to do that, you'll get just as much out of it. So I am going to hand over to the lovely Stephen, who's got a couple of questions for us. And then anybody who wants to pitch in, we'll go from there. So off you go, Steve. Thank you. Simple formatting. Um, did you specify a particular line spacing or font size that you wanted? Uh, no, I did not. I, um, I did say to you that you've got to think about your reader. And yeah. I did specifically say that I thought Comic Sans and Windings would be stupid. But beyond that, it's completely up to you. Yeah, and I remember you saying leave some space on the page for comments, so. Uh, yeah, well, I, more around readability. Yeah. Um, one of the things I often see is really long paragraphs that just go on and on and on and on and on and on. So think about the white space on the page, think about the readability, uh, have one idea for a paragraph. Don't let things get lost in the middle of them. Okay, thank you. And and the next one, word count, 2,000 words plus or minus 10%? Uh, yeah, think think of it as a, a, a barrier rather than a target. Um, there will be some people who are way under. There will be some people who are way over. Um, I look at it, and again, this is my approach. I think I've described, explained it before in class. Don't assume every teacher will be the same. Uh, the way I see it, if you are way under, you're either incredibly succinct or you've missed something. And so you're likely to suffer on the mark score because you've missed something or you haven't articulated things sufficiently clearly. If you are way over, there is a very strong chance that you've either repeated yourself unnecessarily or that you've just uh, given equal weight to a whole lot of issues that probably didn't deserve as much weight. Um, and so you won't be crucified for being over or under, but your marks will be affected by those things. I, I, I... I'm comfortable to say I have it within 10% of the target, but... Then it's likely to be okay and not affected. But turn it in. I did a pre-check with turn it in. It stresses me out a bit because it's count, it's counting bibliography and things and it's showing... Yeah, it does that. So that's yeah. turn it in. And you if, if you do a count the words in Word and put the words in there, I will believe it. Right. Um, otherwise, I, at the end of the day, I'm not being mathematical about it. It could be, frankly, it could be over, but if it's fascinating and not repetitive and covers all the issues, I won't notice. Similarly, if it's under and you just do it very succinctly, I won't notice. But if you repeat yourself over and over again, like I am right now, I will notice and that will have the impact that it has. Thank you for your guidance. That concludes my question. Cool. Goodness me. I, I feel like I'm in the Royal Commission. <laughs> Um, any, any other questions about the assignment? No, no, it's done. Done. It's finished. Have some fun doing it, Sigrid. I did actually. Uh, I will cool. never ever watch Big Bang Theory again. I told my children. 
<laughs> so you picked up the pop culture. Have yeah. you actually, because you are, you are not from around here, as they say in the classics, had you watched The Castle at any point? No, and I said to my son's girlfriend, I'm writing, she said, who's your boss? Because she's just finished her law degree. And I said, oh, my boss is a man called Dennis. I have no idea who he is. And she said, not Dennis DeNuto. I go, yes. Oh, Sigrid, you have to watch The Castle. <laughs> and I went, okay, well, uh, in my holidays. I think, um, I think The Castle is absolutely a mandatory reading, uh, watching, I should say, viewing, uh, so that you can understand why I picked Dennis as your boss. Uh, anybody else? Comments, concerns, frustrations? Is it a good thing that I'm a long way away from you because you can't throw things at me? How about we talk about consideration then? Um, I have, I believe on the screen, you should already be able to see it, uh, a, the in-class problem that I want to deal with today. Uh, it's, um, so basically in a nutshell, I'm going to try and keep that open most of the time. And I'm um, relying on you guys to either have a phone or be able to split your screen up to do different things at the same time. Um, and I want you to go to um, polyv.com slash Nolan Legal. I will just put that in the chat there so you can find it. You've been there before, the same poll stuff that we use in class. Um, and we're going to start working through the problems. In fact, I am, because I want to be able to show you the answers as we go, um, I am going to probably switch between the share screens. So let me just put that into full screen mode. And so let's just talk quickly before I flip the screens, let's just talk about the problem. So <laughs> Timber Top Nurseries um, contacted the company called, oh, company, company of business called Ace Cubbies, which is variously spelt in the quiz in this survey and in, um, in my everywhere as either Ace Cubbies, C-U-B-B-I-E-S or Ace Cubbies, C-U-B-B-Y-S. Um, let's just ignore the typo and make them the same thing. So they were asked to construct 20 architecturally uh, design, designer cubby houses and they needed to be completed by the 1st of October 2011. Um, I probably shouldn't have the year in because you'll see how long I've been doing this same problem for. Uh, contract price is 20,000 bucks. Date was crucial to Timbertop because time was at the time time was needed to have the cubby houses painted and decorated in order to be ready for the Christmas season. And they'd already pre-sold nine of the 20 to a developer who needed them by the 15th of October at the latest. $20,000 had already been paid, so it was paid when they signed the contract. However, Ace Cubbies realised pretty quickly that it had seriously underquoted to the point where they'd actually run out of money and hadn't yet completed the contract. Ace advised Timbertop of the situation and said they'd be unable to continue. Timbertop was aware that it was going to take longer to have the cubbies completed if they engaged another builder and aware that they would lose the business with the developer. So they suggested to Ace that they should complete the work in return for an additional 10 grand. Ace accepted the suggestion. They immediately paid. Timbertop immediately paid two grand. Ace completed and delivered the cubby houses on schedule. Okay, so why go through all of that? Because you can clearly read. Um, firstly, I want to make sure that we're all on the same place. Does this remind you of any cases? It does, and I can't remember which one. That's all right. You've got some facts around it. Can you remember what the, fact, uh, the facts were? Same kind of thing. Um, no money. Ran out of money. Yeah, so Builder ran out of money. So I think you're probably thinking of Roffey Brothers, Williams and Roffey Brothers, or Roffey Brothers and Williams, uh, which is an English decision. There's a similar, there's also an Australian decision that might also be relevant here. 
Um, anybody want to have a go thinking about that? I, I can't remember the names of them. There's, to me, there's two that come to mind. There's the one where past consideration is not good consideration. And then there's the second case where the um, to avoid the detriment of the business actually closing and going bankrupt, then there's seen to be a benefit in the consideration. And okay, past consideration. so what you're doing, Steve, here is brilliant because you are going straight to what the issues are. Um, but what's going to happen? What's going to happen in your exam is you're going to get a, pro, a, a scenario or a number of them a bit like this. And then you're going to have questions that relate to that. Now, they're not going to be lovely multiple choice questions like I'm giving you today. They're going to be questions where you're going to have to give somebody some advice. So when you're first reading, you get 10 minutes if you're an OUA student and 15 minutes if you're a face-to-face -face student. I'm, I'm not sure which, is, which one of you suffers the most as a consequence of that because it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes where you are not allowed to pick up a pencil and you've just got the questions in front of you. And so right then, what you're trying to do in your heads is organise what, what is really going on here. What are the relevant cases? What does this remind me of? What is the area of the law that's going to be relevant? What Steve's done is he's identified two different potential issues. Uh, Past consideration is not good consideration. And he's also identified that there's some sort of case that deals with something that happens after the event. So there's a particular exception to the consideration rule. Anybody remember what it is, what it's called? Practical benefit. Practical benefit, that is it's absolutely right. So already before we even know exactly what the questions are, you're starting to hone in to what's there. Um, so uh, again, uh, William and Roffey Brothers is absolutely the British case. In relation to practical benefit, the Australian, the key Australian case is the Musumeci and Winnedel case. And we'll get to that in a second. So now I am going to flip you into having a look at the first question and we'll head backwards and forwards. Um, I think this should work. So five of you have already flipped. Oh, well, there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six of you. So let's have a look and see what answers you think. So we're asking here whether or not the initial contract was legally binding or not. So let's have a look. And interestingly, six of you, each of you have taken a bet on a different answer which is kind of funny. So let's have a look. So firstly, one of the things that is a real trick for young players in doing these kind of things is going to the end before you've thought about the beginning. So a lot of what you need to do is make sure you are answering the right question. So the question here is, was the contract between Timbertop Nurseries and Ace Cubbies legally binding? So if we flip back, I'll just try and drive carefully here. If we flip back to the problem, um, uh, whoops, sorry, what have I done? Yes, you can see the problem. Um, it basically talks about the contract at the beginning. Contracted with Ace Cubbies to construct 20 architecturally designed cubby houses, there was a price that was paid upon signing. So now it is technically, both have, parties were happy with the agreement. Technically, yes, there is a contract, but. The reason there is a contract is not that because both parties were happy with the agreement. The reason there is a contract is because the both parties were happy with the agreement and there was consideration in return for a promise to pay. So we are talking about, you know, look, and this is why I'm very glad personally we don't have multiple choice in exams because the detail can get lost very easily. 
<laughs> but in a choice between two answers, neither of these answers are perfect, but yes, there was good consideration for that contract is a better answer than just the more vague one. So the people who said no were going to the question of whether or not the revision, the additional payment was enforceable or not. So again, it goes to reading the question a little bit more clearly. So flip back to the question. I need to have multiple screens here. Share. I think you should be able to see that again. Please tell me if you can't. Let's head on to the next question and see where we go from there. Um, sorry, I'm expecting you to interrupt me or to put something in the chat if you want to talk about any of these further. So what was the agreed price for Timbertop Nursery's promise? Delivery of the cubby houses, completion of the contract, signing the contract, or paying ten thousand dollars. Now, if I did this with the cool software, there would be music now. I could put my Spotify on or something. Okay. All right, six of you in there. Let's have a look and see what. People are saying, so basically we had four options. Um, only two of them were selected, um, but delivery of the cubby houses is more correct again. Completion of the contract um, is a little bit vague. Completion of the contract, completion of the contract obligations, both parties have obligations. Um, Timbertop is not paying a price or paying consideration for its own obligations. It's only paying consideration or promising consideration for the other party's obligations. Now, this is all real technical language stuff. In the real world, it only gets you so far. But if you understand these technical nuances, you'll be able to unpick the detail um, as you move forward. All right, questions, concerns, frustrations. I need to remember to look at the camera when I ask you that. All right, let's have a look at the next one. So this should be a nice, quick, easy one. Would it have made any difference to the enforceability of the contract if the parties had agreed that Timbertop would only pay a dollar for the cubby houses? Steve's very confident. He's looking confident. I, I don't have a phone, so I can't bid. <laughs> oh, you're not actually participating? No, I, I'm sorry. I left my phone downstairs and I'll oh, whisk right. it and get it. And I can see by the skyline there that you're at, um, you're at uh, RMIT. Yeah, I'm in my second home. I'll have to, uh, have to show you how to split screen so you can have two things going on at once. Okay, most people are in. Let's have a look, see what people think. Again, let's see, we're always a split. One of the reasons I like people to do these things is because you commit to an answer. So the majority of you are there, you're right. The reason for that is that consideration doesn't need to be adequate, it just needs to be sufficient. So whether they'd underquoted by $40,000, or $10,000 or $20,000, it actually doesn't matter. Um, the price that they agree is the consideration. And as long as there is an agreed price, as long as there is consideration, and by agreed price, I mean a price for the promise. And in that case, it's the price for the promise to build the cubby houses. It doesn't matter whether it was sufficient or not. So it is not relevant to solving this problem whether or not there was an appropriate price. It's only relevant whether there was a price at all. Any questions there? So, and that does get a little bit tricky when you're thinking about it in this kind of context because we've already, we've realised that the price isn't enough money, that Ace Cubbies can't afford 
to continue to uh, be in business or to, to deliver the, pro uh, the goods at that cost. All right. Would it have made any difference if the developer had offered to pay the $10,000 instead? We can talk about what difference it might make in a minute, but do you think it would make any difference if instead of Timbertop paying that or offering to pay that $10,000, the developer who's waiting on, what is it, nine of the cubbies? Yeah, nine of the cubbies are going directly to a developer. To wait for you for a minute because people aren't I can see whether you've submitted or not okay let's have a look bit of a spread people adjust as they see what other people have put in um, basically the majority of you are in the right space here um, if we had something else not just pay the money, then we might have consideration there. So if the developer had said, I'll give you another $10,000 if you get this done, and I'll throw in a bag of nails to make sure that you put them together the way I want them put together, that would probably create a completely separate contract. Kathy, if the developer said, um, I'll pay you the $10,000 and you get them here two days earlier, same? Uh, I'm not sure about time as such, because remember, the promise to build the cubbies is a promise to, um, uh, to Timbertop, not to the developer. So we have a privity issue that sits in there as well. So they could still... But actually, no, I'm, as I say that out loud, saying that they'll, if you can, if you can promise me that you get them a day earlier, that's a promise to them. And they, well, but it's not really a promise. No. Because they may, yeah, it's just, I, I need consideration to move both ways in that promise to the, um, to ace cubbies so remember they've got a duty to um they've got a duty to timber top but if they're going to deliver early plus for extra money paid to them by somebody else and then they can still actually meet their first agreement yeah it depend on how it was worded it's okay. possible um, what you're doing there, your question goes to the rule in Pinnell's case. So I love it how, as we talk about things, uh, um, people adjust their answers and um, I get you more and more close to correct. Okay, new question. True or false? Consideration was provided by Ace Cubbies to Timbertop Nurseries for the payment of $30,000. Technical question here. I've got too much aniseed in my tea. Mm. Okay, let's have a look at what you think. Four of you have been brave enough. A little bit of an adjustment. Backwards, forwards, are you settled? The majority of you are correct. So there is consideration for the promise to pay $20,000, but there is no consideration for the promise to pay the additional 10 based on the facts that we have. Um, so it's about two thirds of you there. Um, if anybody, does anybody have any questions about that? I think as we work through the next few questions, I think the reasons for that will become clear if it's a little bit muddy.
to those of you who didn't see the answer straight away. So what about this? Oh, I just gave you the answer to this one. A little bit more detail required in the uh, response. So did Ace Cubbies provide consideration to Timbertop for the additional payment of the 10 grand? Yes, by completing those on time. No, it was a promise to perform an existing legal duty. Yes, Timbertop promised to pay Ace, so it was bound by the promise. No, original contract price can't be altered. So I'm not just looking for the answer, but the why. I can't say how many of you have submitted. So let's just hope for the best. Okay, so again, the majority of you are correct here. So there was a promise to pay, to perform an existing legal duty. So there was the consideration for the $20,000 was that promise to pay, uh, was the promise to build the cubbies and deliver them by a particular date at a particular point in time. There's nothing in the facts that you were provided with that suggests that there was any variation to that. Now, as Steve mentioned before, if there'd been some other change there, uh, something like uh, we'll change the number from 20 to 19 that need to be delivered by that date, um, and we'll give you an extra $10,000 and you will also need to do something more in exchange for that promise. If there was a bear, there needed to really be a variation of that, that change. If they didn't vary it in any way, is there anything else that they could have done to make sure that the promise to pay was enforceable? Is there anything, if Ace Cubbies had gone and seen you, they were really wanted to make sure they got that extra money, what would you have advised them to do? I think they can like sort of have a deed of variation of the contract. Perfect. Yeah, that's so, and one of the reasons you would use a deed yes. is because you don't need consideration in the deed. Yeah, and there's correct. no argument then about it. Um, and again, being a deed of variation, what you are specifically agreeing is our old contract said this, the price was twenty thousand dollars. Our new contract it says that the price is $30,000 in total. Nothing else has changed. We agree this is a deed. We sign, seal and deliver it and it, it works. So yeah, well done, Anna. Um, let's see, what's next here? So which exception to the existing legal duty rule could the agreement between Timbertop and ACE to pay the additional 10,000 fall into. Just yell out if you want to say none. Sorry. Okay. I think people are getting nervous. There's only three responses, but I'm going to show. Oh, there was a forced response came in at the last minute. Um, okay, let's have a look. Definitely 
practical benefit is right. Bonafide compromise of a legal claim is another way that it could have gone, but we don't have enough in the facts. So if at this, at this particular point in time, so I'm just going to flip back to the facts, nobody's in breach of the contract at the time that the promise to pay the additional amount of money is made. Okay, so if, um, if they had, there'd been a breach and ACE companies were arguing, let's say you misrepresented how much work would be involved in this and we're going to bring a claim under Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law because you misdescribed uh, what it is that we would need to do. And Timbertop said, look, it's going to cost us less money in the long run to just settle this. We're completely in the right here, but on a without prejudice basis, we're going to settle this claim in a bona fide way. We'll pay you an additional $10,000 and you need to settle out the contract. That could happen, but we don't actually have that in these facts. Fresh consideration is... Fresh consideration would need fresh consideration on both sides. So in addition to that extra $10,000, Ace Cubbies would need to give fresh consideration for that promise. So Ace has provided a promise to pay $10,000, has in fact paid $2,000 of it. Ace would need to do something in exchange. Promise to deliver earlier, um, throw in an extra cubby house, add a third story, throw in, I don't know, an old shoe, doesn't really matter, doesn't need to be sufficient. Sorry, it does need to be sufficient. It doesn't need to be adequate. It just needs to be fresh consideration. Questions there? Concerns? Frustrations? You're all, you're all, it's just such a good, clever class and yet you're so quiet. <laughs> You do not argue with me. I get to talk the whole time. It's exhausting. It's the only thing I don't like about this group. You're all just too quiet. Sorry. Say stuff like that. Okay. okay. Something okay. for everybody. Yeah, that's um, right. my, my mother told me, if you can't say something smart, be quiet. So you read into that what you will. <laughs> Maybe the others are smart. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with your mother. The worst thing that can happen in this situation, which is one of the reasons I do these this way, is for me to ask a question and some smart ass to give me the correct answer straight away. Uh, because if you give me the correct answer straight away, I don't even I don't know whether you understand the answer, much less anybody else. There's a very good chance you just did the quiz earlier and you know what what to say. Um, and you showing off, you don't learn anything. And unless we go through some of the other ways. So frankly, um, with the greatest respect to your mother, who I'm sure is a lovely lady, um, we, have different, uh, we have a different approach. So this particular question, this time instead of a multiple choice, I want to hear from you. Can you type in a good. what practical benefit Timber Talk Nursery will get from Ace Cubbies promising to do what they already had promised to do under the contract. What is the, what is the benefit? So I'm going to flip. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm still in the class problem. Do you want to have, let me flip back to the question. Oh, I get myself caught up so easily. That's what the question looks like. But I think it's probably more useful <laughs> to um, have a look at the problem while you're doing it. Do you want me to type in for you there, Steve? I can see your Helen-esque yeah. approach to answering the I question. Can type. Yeah, I don't know. Um. Oh. Happy to talk about it too, by the way, if you don't want to type and you just want to throw in your answer. It's okay. just if you want to do it anonymously, then we can pick apart your answers. 
I, th I thought the benefit was that they, they can retain the contract. There, yeah, there was... Tell me more about that. Retain the contract with... Um, Timbertop would retain the... I can remember who's through... Not not with... Um, nothing to do with Ace Cubby's Timbertop's um, contract with the end buyer. The developer. The developer. So the yeah. developer. So, in fact, not only retained, they would not be in breach of their contract with the developer. Okay. Because at the moment, they have promised under a contract with the developer to deliver those cubbies on the 15th. So they've allowed four days for painting them before they send nine of them over. So there's, there's a really strong practical benefit. So I knew you were on the right track, but again, we're lawyers, so we get precise. Retain the contract, which contract, with whom, why? Uh, let me flip back here and we'll see what other things people are saying. If any of you have said anything at all. So they can fulfill their contract with the developer by getting the houses completed on time so they don't default on their contract. Absolutely. Delivery of the cubby houses within the agreed deadline per the original contract terms. Perfect. Other things might include that it would cost more money to go and get somebody else to go and finish the cubby houses at this late stage. Um, if they had in fact been underquoted, then chances are that anybody else stepping in is going to cost a great deal more money. Things like that are relevant, even though under Australian rules, um, sorry, even though under the common law rule, Australia and otherwise, consideration doesn't need to be adequate, it just needs to be sufficient. Under the Australian uh, key case that deals with practical benefit, uh, that's Musumeci and Winnedell, um, Justice Santow was very clear that one of the requirements in an Australian context is that the practical benefit needed to represent uh, a greater value than what the cost would have been. Or sorry, the cost needs to represent a greater value than what the benefit is. So there needs to, there needs to be some economic assessment in that context. Questions, concerns, frustrations? It's a little bit harder when you're being thrown a question, you actually have to put language in it yourself. And the next question is, what do you reckon? Does, K, does Ace Cubbies have a claim against Timbertop for the outstanding $8,000? In other words, is there a basis on which Ace can claim that further payment? So either no, it's not in the original contract, Yes, under the practical benefit exception to the rule. No, it's an existing legal duty, so there was no consideration. Or yes, Timbertop agreed to pay it. Now, of course, none of those answers are perfect. I want to see the, the best of the choices that you have. Some of you are not being brave, only three submissions. Let's have a look. So majority of you are again correct. Um, now, if this question had been phrased slightly differently, does Ace Covey's have a claim for um, under breach of contract for the outstanding $8,000? Now we're not looking at breach. Uh, in this subject, but if it had been worded something like that, or if it had been worded, does Ace Cubbies, or does Timotop Nurseries have a contractual obligation to pay the outstanding $8,000? The answer would have been no. Because there is no contract, the payment of that $8,000 is under an exception to the requirement for consideration. So the general rule is, you need consideration in order to have an agreement. 
there are then a number of exceptions to that rule. One of those exceptions is the practical benefit exception, exemption. And so as a consequence of there being, it looks like a practical benefit, it appears to me that there would be sufficient in the evidence that you've been given in the problem, sufficient there to at least make a claim that because of the practical benefit, consideration wasn't required for the promise to pay the $10,000. And so the rest of the promise is binding. So that's the tricky piece here. Um, so again, I wanted you to pick the best of the answers there. Based on this question, does Ace Covey's have a claim against Timbertop for the outstanding $8,000? I think the better answer there is yes, it does because of that exception. Question, concern? Um, yes, can I ask? Yeah. Sorry, I just have um, a question on to that. So if the contract actually had any um, uh, probably clauses in that particular um, contract, which sort of uh, stated that an amendment can be made, so whether it might not be uh, necessarily a, be a written one, would that still fall under the, would that actually be then an exception? So yeah, where, it'd be... It's a really good question, Maria. Thank you. It's, you would need to go to the words. So what is quite common in standard form agreements is to have a provision that says, unless both parties to this agreement sign a document confirming their agreement to a change, then no change, you know, the, the agreement won't be varied. But to vary an agreement... Uh, you still need consideration moving both ways. Now, the consideration might be very uh, minor. It might be for, you know, the nominal consideration for the agreement for a bag of nails. You could even have the ridiculous situation where uh, Ace Cubbies pays a dollar for the promise to receive $10,000. That doesn't matter. Um, okay. The better way to do it would be to have a deed. But if... If the agreement contemplated something, then it could certainly work. So another thing that could often happen is that an agreement might contemplate that there'll be a change to the price if something happens and it's already in the agreement itself. So if the price of nails goes up or timber goes up or CPI goes up or the stock exchange falls by a certain amount or whatever it happens to be, there might be a recalculation clause, but you would need to look at the words very carefully. Okay. Thank you. Pleasure. So in Musumeci and Winnedel, uh, sorry, the software does not let me cite correctly. Santow held that the practical benefit exceptions should be accepted in Australia with three modifications. One of those modifications was that a practical benefit should only constitute good consideration if the beneficiary's performance can be regarded by the modifying party as worth more than any remedy against them, such as damages. So if you would get more in damages than you would get by doing the, practi or by the, the practical benefit, then the practical benefit exception doesn't apply. But if practical benefit is worth more to you than what you would get in damages, then it can work. True, false, should have put in, don't care. <laughs> Just in case, it's only fair. Let's have a look. Oh, look. 100% be golden, could be something to do with the fact that I mentioned it a couple of minutes ago, but then you just make me feel good, make me think you're listening. Very last one. More for my information than anything else. How are you feeling about consideration at the moment? Drop your finger or your cursor at a point in time. Let's see what you think. I can't tell who you are, so if you want to put angry face in there, that's fine. 
<laughs> Just look smiley while you go, oh, yuck, 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 I dare. Now, if you're all being shy, oh, it could be because I'm not showing the results. And uh, everybody, they're tiny little places, couple there and a couple here. Oh, and a couple feel very confident. Okay, well, that's good. So if you're still, if you're down in this area, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor, that might help. If you're down in that area, I want you to spend a little bit of time really identifying what, what the areas are that are confusing you. And you come back to me with some specific questions or you use that to go back into the table of contents in your textbook and have a look back to see, okay, where do I need to read again? Where do I need to work smart? Now, a lot of this stuff in today's exercise has been really focused on getting the technical language right so that you understand the core principles. In reality, whether or not there is consideration is very rarely in the cases. And you can see that because you see how few modern cases we are dealing with. Um, so it's important to actually understand that what we're doing here is by its nature a little bit odd. We are trying to understand what the law is in relation to making contracts by looking at situations where at least one party wanted to get out of a contract. And all the formation or got, get out of an obligation or a promise that they'd made. Um, so think about the context there. Um, but it is valuable to think about, well, okay, if I need this agreement to be enforceable, then I need to be able to point to the consideration, both sides, both parties need to have it, or I need to be able to point to um, the parties doing something to make sure it was enforceable, whether that's using a deed or whether it's making sure that there's nominal consideration. Um, Yes, there are a ton of little exceptions that we've been talking about. So today we talked a lot about practical benefit, but they are basically arguments that we use down the track when it's gone pear-shaped. You can't plan for a practical benefit when you're writing the contract. So I just want you to remember that, particularly as your next assignment is likely to advise somebody who's making a contract. They haven't written it yet. I need to have it written by the end of the week. I know that. It's promised to you for some time next week, but let's see how we go. All right, I'll be in class tomorrow, fresh faced and ready to go. Um, I think we're gonna be talking about intention tomorrow, but we might be talking about certainty. I can't remember which way those two go, but I'll be doing my prep for that class tomorrow. Um, if you've got any questions in the meantime, don't hesitate. Um, and be nice to yourselves. You guys have worked hard to get that, get to where you are. We're heading into week six. Um, for my OUA lovelies, I will be available for some drop-in chats tomorrow over the course of the day if you want to chat with me about your assignments. I will not be available on Tuesday. I will only be available on Monday. And clearly I won't be available while I'm in the face-to-face -face class, which runs from 5.30 Melbourne time. Um, so I did send an email around to both classes with a link that you can use to make an appointment with me tomorrow if you want to. Uh, so use that. But otherwise... I think you meant to say 6.30 Melbourne time. 6.30 Melbourne time, you're right. I need to leave home by 5.30 Melbourne time. Which means you can't talk to me from 5.30 Melbourne time for the purpose of that actual discussion. <laughs> Um, because otherwise I'll be in the car and that's, I'm not a good driver when I'm not talking to somebody on the phone. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, Kath. Kath, sorry. Yeah. Marie here again. Just a, uh, I just had a quick question actually about the assignment. Um, 
just in relation to previously when we were doing the introduction, we were always asked to put in the facts of the case quite well, and you know, and it actually takes up quite a bit of the actual memo of advice. Yeah. So I was just sort of wondering in in our memo of advice now, do you expect us to have that level of detail, or is it more of a brief sort of really just a summary and then go into the questions, which is really the ones that you'd like us to address about the key issues and things like that? Well, How much of a detail do you want? In this case, you're, the scenario is you are writing to your boss, so another lawyer, okay. who's got access to the same file and the same information you have. So think about why you would repeat the facts. Um, if there's no controversy, they can just look on the file. And I think the question even says, I think the um, instructions you have even say you can refer to the file for the facts. So. Um, Anna's nodding her head. She's got more attention to detail than I have, so I'm going to but check that just in case she might be. Thank you. So, but having said that, there are times when you're going to need to refer to the facts, particularly if uh, you're making an assumption about them or if something turns on them, if you need to refer to them in some way where it turns. It, one of the things that you'll notice uh, is the people who submit later get higher Turnitin scores. And often that's because you are copying and pasting the facts from the document that you've been given into the document that you're submitting. If you're just copying and pasting, you're not adding any value, I'm not interested, you're wasting words. Uh, but if you are talking about the facts in a way that helps your boss understand why something is relevant, then it's useful. So your boss's time is money. They don't want to. They don't want to waste it. Thank you. Pleasure. Anything else? Okay. My husband just got home. I'm hoping he brought dinner with him. But otherwise, I think I need to go in and do something about cooking. So I will see you all tomorrow, or you'll hear my voice not too long after that. Lovely. Thank you, Kath. Thank you, Kath. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.